Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christy Wooten. I'm president of the Atlanta Press Club. Thank you for joining us today for our online newsmaker event, John Lewis, Good Trouble. As you know, Congressman Lewis has been battling cancer. His most recent public appearance was with Washington, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser after the painting and naming of Black Lives Matter Plaza in June. Our thoughts are with him today as we discuss the life and legacy of our United States Congressman from Georgia's 5th District, John Robert Lewis. During this unprecedented time of pandemic, political division, and social unrest, online gatherings such as these allow us to engage experts and journalists in topical discussions about current events and popular culture. We'd like to remind you today, if you have any questions for our speakers or moderator, please type them into the chat or Q&A panels on your Zoom screen. These can both be accessed by clicking on the corresponding icons at the bottom of the Zoom window. Thank you for supporting the work of the Atlanta Press Club just by being here at this webinar today. Please visit atlantapressclub.org for our upcoming events, to sponsor an event, to join as a member, or to donate to the club. As we begin, we'd like to thank Georgia EMC for their program sponsorship of today's Newsmaker event. We've asked Karen Greer, an anchor at Atlanta CBS 646 station, to lead the discussion today. A longtime Atlanta resident, Karen has a history of hands-on community involvement and serves on the Board of Governors for the, for the National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences. Karen is the recipient of six Southeast Emmy Awards, two awards from the Atlanta Association of Black Journalists, and a Salute to Excellence Award from the National Association of Black Journalists. Uh, she's also on our Board of Directors at the Atlanta Press Club and a former president at the club. Please welcome Karen. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. How are you? I am honored, excited to be here with you. This is truly gonna be an amazing event. So we are excited to be able to bring it to you. Hopefully you have had a chance to view the documentary. If you've got uh, Netflix and you've popped it up, you can't get away from it, I gotta tell you. I had to watch it a couple times in the screening and then I bought it on my Netflix. So I know you will all love it and I'm glad you are joining us to talk about it with these amazing uh, young women and our historian extraordinaire who's gonna give us a little history into a lot of this. So we're pleased to host this discussion uh, about the new documentary film, John Lewis, Good Trouble. If anyone has ever met or talked to the Congressman, he loves to talk to you about his good trouble and his home of uh, Alabama. He will tell you about that as well as you see in the documentary. It chronicles his life, his career, um, as a civil rights activist and our Democratic Congressman from the 5th Congressional District, which he is so proud of. Although we're not gonna screen the documentary here, we wouldn't have the time to get through this all in one hour, but we are gonna show you some um, clips of it. We've got a little bit of it and some stills throughout the program. And uh, we wanna right now welcome the director and producer, as well as our historian and an activist who is a part of this as well today. So joining us right now, Don Porter, Erica Alexander, yay! <laughs> Hello, ladies. Hi, Karen, thank you so much. Documentary filmmaker whose work has appeared on national and global platforms, including HBO, PBS, Discovery, and Netflix. In addition to directing Don Lewis Good Trouble, she's working on a project with former Obama's White House photographer, which I can't wait to see, Pete Souza, and directing and executive producing an Apple TV documentary series with the one and only Ms. O, Oprah Winfrey, and Prince Harry focused on mental illness. So welcome Don Porter to join us. Hey, let's hear a big round of applause. Yeah, it's so nice to see you. <laughs> All right, and right there, many of us know this face uh, for her acting roles in Living Single and Get Out, but she's also a film producer in her own right, co-founder of Color Farm Media and board member of Vote Run Lead a group working to bring equity, inclusion, and diverse representation to media technology and electoral politics. So please join me in welcoming the fabulous Erica Alexander. Woo! Thank you, thank you, Karen, appreciate it. Very nice to see you today, you look fantastic. You do as well, she's on West Coast time, so you know what, she looks great <laughs> to be on West Coast time, doesn't she? <laughs> yes, well, yes. Before we begin, we want to remind everybody out there that uh, we've got, if you've got questions for our guests, all you have to do is enter them into the chat section there um, in the Q&A panel. Click the icon at the bottom of your Zoom. All right. We all ready to go? Because we like to be on time, you know, 2.06. You know, you've got <laughs> things to do. 
Um, mm -hmm. this, this documentary was amazing, ladies. I, I thought you did such an incredible job. And I'm just wondering, since um, you know, you're not from this area, why did you choose John Lewis's story, his history, what he's done? Why did you want to chronicle that? Yeah, um, you know, uh, first of all, it's so great to be here. Um, I love the city of Atlanta. I've actually spent quite a bit of time there. Um, and uh, you have just such a, a rich sense of African-American culture and history when you are in, in uh, Atlanta metro area. So I, I think starting there, you know, John Lewis, uh, although he's, you know, born in Alabama and makes his home in, in Atlanta, is really just the most American of national treasures um, and, and what his life and legacy have, have gifted us is, uh, you know, such a blueprint for how we move forward in troubled times. So um, CNN Films came to me and asked if I would be interested in doing a film about the congressman. I just leapt at the chance. Um, Erica was already working with the congressman's office. She approached me and so we, we joined up together. And here uh, it's really a situation of one plus one equals 274 um, because uh, we just took off along with our, uh, my producer, Laura Michael Chazan and Erica's co-founder of Color Farm, Ben Arnon. Um, and, you know, we just all kind of dove right in and uh, it's, it's been a wonderful experience. Erica, how about you? Um, uh, John Lewis is a founding father of America. And we have founding, new founding fathers and new founding mothers um, throughout history. I don't think they get to be the last word on it. And he's an extraordinary man. The fact that he comes from Atlanta and um, there's so much history inside of the South to how America was built and how um, our citizens with African-Americans came through there and made those roads and all those things and endured the Civil War. And, and also the civil rights, um, uh, second reconstruction and also Martin Luther King is from there. It's just a fantastic story and it needed to be told. Dawn Porter is an excellent um, filmmaker and uh, she's a great storyteller. So, you know, it's, it was wonderful because I don't spend much time in Atlanta unless I'm filming. You know, it's become a great film hub. And so it gave me more time to learn about the city and learn about um, the leaders in it and how they built my life. And um, I was very honored to be a part of it. That's interesting. And um, you guys being in separate places, but I'm sure it, it was a big deal everywhere. Earlier over the weekend, uh, we had a group that erroneously reported that we lost the congressman, that he had died over the weekend. And I had the opportunity to talk to his son and, and family and friends and and they said, no, this isn't true. And, you know, Andy Young saying, he's not ready to go yet. So you guys, you're fine. So he finishes what he needs to do. Um, as a filmmaker, as an actress, you really, through female eyes, had a chance to see what he has meant and how hard he has fought uh, this battle, both with civil rights and with his health right now. Um, what did you learn about John Lewis, the man? Because you can tell in the early film when you guys, it looks like when you started, it was before he'd made his um, announcement that he had stage four pancreatic cancer. And then you could see through the film that he was losing weight and was, you know, not as robust as he was before. So what did you learn about the man? You know, um, we, so the diagnosis came after we completely finished the film. And wow. You're, you're a very astute viewer because um, I did notice that he was, you know, looking a little frail. You know, we have the benefit of filming him with these snapshots in time. And so you could see, you know, you could see things when you put together the whole film that you didn't, that weren't quite really right in front of you. But I think um, the thing that, that strikes me so much, and Erica speaks so beautifully about this, is the Congressman is really a gentleman um, he is really uh, kind of the best of the old school um, in that he values people and he values kindness um, and he doesn't just say it, he models it. 
So, you know, small things. We would come to his house early in the morning and he had been to Costco. <laughs> and, you know, people love Costco. The, the congressman loves Costco. Um, you know, or he holds the door for you. You know, he asked about my children. You know, just, just um, things that are common courtesies that are in some ways are all too rare these days. So it was just really pleasant to be around him. Um, he's a, an incredibly optimistic person. And, you know, that really on so many levels influenced me and, and also the way to tell his story. Because despite all of the terrible things that he has seen, he retains this deep love of this country and a great optimism for its future. And, and that really, um, you know, made a big impact on me as a, as a person, you know, not just a filmmaker, but a person. Try to be good and mute myself so that you wouldn't hear anything there you behind go. me. Okay, so there's a trailer that needs to run now too. So before Erica, you talk to me about the Congressman. Let's see the trailer. Cannot replace the job. Let's restart this. Sorry about this. When you see something that is not right, do something. Get in Trevor. Good Trevor. If John Lewis, as a 19, 20 year old, wasn't doing what he did, I would not be here. Too many people struggled and died for every American to exercise their right to vote. Cannot replace the John Lewis. We have forces in America today who want to take us back, but we're not going back. We're going forward. Brings tears to me every time you guys did such an amazing job on that. So, Erica, talk to me about the congressman. He has the courage of his convictions. That can't be said enough. There are a lot of people who are disloyal to themselves, disloyal to the things that they've learned, whether it's in college or from their parents or from life. They'll throw it away in a moment. He had the courage to move forward on his convictions from the time that he was a teenager throughout multiple assassinations, all sorts of unrest and rioting, unfairness, uh, more assassinations to this day, murders, and he continues to move. He, right, he, he is currently in a protest right now. He has not attended the um, um, State of the Union or the inauguration of this president because he said he was elected illegitimately. He is true courage and power and bravery. And I think a great example for older people who continue to wonder whether it's worth it what they've been doing or does it break through and for uh, middle-aged people who are frustrated and impatient and thinking maybe there needs to be something more to be done and they're probably right in how to do it. And then of course, for younger people who don't know the type of sacrifice that their life will have to make in, in order to come to the types of, of results that they want. And they have a lot of criticism of this country, but they better be ready to give up, um, to stand and deliver. And that's what he shows. Now looking at you two young ladies, I think Erica, you're from Arizona. Um, and Don, from the DC area, is that right? Uh, New York, but I did live New in York DC originally. Okay. So talk to me, would you be where you are without all of what he has done to this point? Talk about that as well, how we're feeling some of the effects of you know, him being arrested and countless times beaten in the head. Um, you guys followed his tracks throughout. I, absolutely certain that none of us would be where we are. Um, what the civil rights workers did um, in dismantling segregation the way they did was they showed a model of smart, capable, um, and effective leaders. 
and it was impossible. You know, what segregation was doing was essentially denying the humanity of black people. And those civil rights workers, those students refused to let their humanity, their full humanity be denied. And uh, the way they did it was so intentional and so beautiful and so flawlessly executed that it was hard to argue with their fact, with their, you know, pleas for equality. So by the time it comes to our generation, Erica, I'm gonna put you in my generation for now. <laughs> um, you know, we, the battles we fought were, um, were different. We weren't fighting just to get in the door then you know the fight continues to continue to be thought of as intelligent as capable etc but you know they just had to fight to get in the door i mean when you think of what john lewis and the other activists were asking for to sit in a, a drugstore and have a hamburger and a coke to ride a bus interstate to get a library card these are kind of like they had to make a basic argument for their humanity and so we do not necessarily have to do that. So when people say nothing has changed, you know, I point to, um, I, I think not enough has changed, but that's not the same as saying, you know, nothing has changed. We've got some audience questions here as well. One being, um, when did you start filming this? And she mentioned you started before his diagnosis and two, um, someone says, as long as they've known him, they're curious to know what you want the viewers to leave the film with as an experience, a call to action. Yeah, so we started um, before the 2018 elections. Um, so when the congressman who was at that time running unopposed, um, uh, he became a surrogate for other candidates and he was out there. So we, I was really interested in following, you know, I am a DC kid, you know, I lived there for 10 years. I lived on Capitol Hill. I kind of got the political bug. Um, so I was just curious about what it's like to be a legislator, you know, in this time and what his role would be. Um, so we wanted to follow him while he was out campaigning. And while, you know, there was a very big dramatic element, which is where the Democrats going to take back the house. So we started filming, you know, in the spring of, of 2018 and followed for a year of filming through the congressional cycle. Um, and then as far as what people should take away, I, you know, and, and I love for Erica to join in here as well, but um, uh, democracy, freedom and justice is a long fight. It is not uh, something that you can snap your fingers and solve. And so, you know, John Lewis's message is one of uh, strategy and understanding what is standing in your way. So, you know, you'll see in the film that those uh, civil rights activists, they studied, they planned for days and weeks and months before anybody stepped on a bridge. There was a plan for what they were gonna do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then what they were gonna do the next months and weeks and years. So. Um, I think when we're in this, um, you know, moment where so many people are voicing their opposition to injustice, that is very exciting. And then I think the next phase is, you know, what is our plan? You know, where are we going to, how are we going to harness this energy? You know, it's like having a big windmill. How are we going to use that energy for our collective good? Yeah, John Lewis, um, I hope they take from this film a, a, a clear picture of what his life looked like and how um, we influence each other by just coexisting and doing what's in front of us. I really um, am grateful that he held the country accountable for the promise that it made to all of its citizens. And um, that if it said that all men were created equal and um, that we are, there should be justice for all or, you know, a more, perfect union um, should be had, then he wanted them to deliver. And he put his body on the line as collateral. And I think he asked, what are you willing to do? What are you willing to do to create and nurture the country and this democracy that I continue to say, and that he says very clearly, that is a moving target, that we have to do it together, and that he believes the vote is essential. So I hope people get out there and they vote 
not only in the national, but in the local elections. Hey, Erica, while we've got you up, what's this experience been like for you? Used to being in front of the camera, for sure. You do such a great job at doing that. But Thank to be a producer, to be behind the scenes, to call the shots, um, hopefully you're going to still stay in front of the camera too, but what's that balance like? Well, thank you so much, Karen, for the, the compliment. I appreciate it. Um, uh, Dawn calls the shot, so I just get out of her way. <laughs> get out of her way, baby. That's just a belief. She, yeah. she, she does, well, I shouldn't be sexist, but she does coordinate her outfits too. So she has incredible taste. And I'm just like, what are we going to wait? I don't believe that. <laughs> you know, the truth of it is that I started dressing like her by the end of it. I realized I was starting. I do that. I actually, it, it, the people imprint on me, especially if, you know, you find yourself admiring somebody you want to and you embody them. So I have a few outfits that when I put them on, those are my dawn outfits. And I feel very confident in them. But also, you know, I have to say, who best to tell us this uh, strong Black man story than a Black woman? And whether it's me inside of, a, um, uh, you know, there was a team of strong women and uh, uh, head, headed by this black woman we call Dawn Porter, um, because black women specifically endure, continue unfairness in this world. And um, if you're going to, you know, talk about people who vote for the village, who uh, hold up, they, what do they say, half of the sky and are the moral majority in America, it's black women. So I think who better to see very clearly this man's story. So I, I'm, I'm glad to be in front of the camera when I can. I did a lot of this in terms of building out my skill set as a matter of, of preservation for a career that I thought would be limited by the fact that there are not enough roles for black women. There truly aren't. And there's a lot better than it used to be. Um, when I started in 1984, there are very few and there were no ingenues. So I spent my life waiting to get older to try to play the roles that they would cast us, whether it was the DA or the judge or those things. But um, right now I get to help make and create those opportunities. And I'll always be grateful that Dawn, um, for a young company, Color Farm, and uh, her partner, Laura Michael Chisholm, created a space for us to come and learn from them how to make uh, these types of stories. Okay, Maxine, I mean, Erica. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Answers to that, by the way. I answered to we that. We have been at lunch, and someone will say Max, and she will turn around. The answer to Max. Right. Shoot, she's living a better life than I am, so I might as well <laughs> take it. Take it. I got to tell you, one of the one of the parts that I loved of this, because having been here more than thirty years in Atlanta, covering all of these people, I didn't know the true story behind the nineteen eighty six run. John Lewis had against his dear friend Julian Bond. Quite a story, isn't oh, it? Oh my goodness. <laughs> and of course, Julian's son, Michael Julian Bond, is on the Atlanta City Council right now. But talk about that and why that was important to put in here. I don't think a lot of people won't know what really happened, especially the newcomers to Atlanta. Yeah, you know, um, well, first of all, as a filmmaker, when you stumble upon archive that is that delicious. <laughs> It's Julian Bond and John Lewis registering voters, um, but then Brian Gumbel putting yeah. them in the hot seat, putting those friends next to each other, and just Mr. Calm Cucumber knowing that the, you know, the sparks are flying. Um, it was a drug test. Television, you know? Um, but I, I also think that uh, there's a certain kind of flatness to the way our civil rights story and the way we understand how our politicians got to be where they are that leaves out the texture, it leaves out the messy parts. And when people are thinking about entering public service, I'm like, you know, it's not always so linear. Even my sweet congressman who I adore had a couple moments. Um, so I, I felt like it was almost like filling in his humanity. He's, he's, he's a person who, you know, make some decisions we like, make some decisions we don't like. But I also thought as a person who studies uh, government and leadership, I was really fascinated at um, these two, you know, civil rights lions and what happened when you put them in that same arena. Um, 
you know, and how they came through it. So I, I just thought it was important to remind us that everything is not linear and smooth all the time. But was it hard to get people to discuss it? Well, the congressman wouldn't discuss it. <laughs> so I asked him nine ways till Sunday and he just said, Julian's a good friend. And da, 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 da. so, you know, we all have grandmothers who avoid a answering questions that they'd rather not answer. So, you know, That's the footage happy. for itself. Yeah. Um, and, and I thought it's enough for people, you know, I, I hope somebody does follow up because I do think that there's a story about what black politicians um, maybe politicians in general, but particularly, I think that there's a story about black politicians and the boxes that we are put into um, that I think is really interesting. I agree, I agree. All right, we, we have some more questions from the audience. Uh, something you learned about the Congress's life and journey that surprised you and what surprised the viewers? Yeah, I think um, his art collection was a surprise. Um, John Lewis has one of the greatest collections of original Jacob Lawrence, Charles White, uh, and Romare Bearden. Um, he had more of them like stacked up in the basement. <laughs> hey, I was surprised to see how much was on the floor. <laughs> and I was just like, Congressman, um, he rotates the paintings in his house like a gallery does. Um, but he has a deep appreciation for beauty, which I also thought was so interesting because he's seen so much ugliness, but in his house, it's very calm very light, you know, he'd just gone through a renovation of his house. Um, and a lot of the renovation was in order to showcase the art. And you know, how you change your surroundings shows your priorities. And his priorities really were giving, you know, a real home to these paintings that he, that he loves. So it was really surprising because we know him so fierce, you know, and to see how quiet he is at home. Um, and how much like beauty and music and, you know, kind of beautiful things are part of his, that he, he works really hard to cultivate that. I want to ask you both, do you think um, the U.S. is at a point of, uh, it says infection in terms of racial equity, equal justice for all as we take down the statues across America? Uh, who besides John Lewis would you suggest we should actually uh, memorialize? Um, I love this question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Ida Wells, uh, you know, suffragist activist, Chicagoan, fierce, Chicago alum, started yeah. kindergarten for Black children. In addition to being a muckraking journalist, um, I mean, I am obsessed with this woman, and um, you know, and then the other person I would say is like a Patsy Mink. Or I don't, I cannot think of statues to Asian Americans in our culture. And I would really like to, to you know, to, to point out like so many contributions. I, I feel like the civil rights stories of Asian Americans are like, are behind. You know, there was this beautiful PBS series I would recommend to everybody, The Asian Americans, you know, and just... I just was blown away. I, I was, you know, saying, I was like, I feel like a white person. Like, I'm like, this is revealed to me, this history. And I was upset that I didn't know it. And, and I, I wanted to learn more. So I really enjoyed, enjoyed that. So I can't, I would say maybe, maybe Patsy Mink, but I would say like, I, I, I think we should affirmatively go out and look and say, who should we begin our statues to? Who, you know, who are we surrounded with is so inspirational. She's just one person who came to mind, but there are so many others. Yes, I, I vote for Harriet, Barbara Jordan, Toni Morrison, Cecily Tyson. Look, look, let me tell you something. There's all these women that are behind, so-called behind the scenes in the civil rights that they were not given their due. There's so many different documentaries and stories that need to be told. Where every time I look on the, uh, the channels that you know play these types of things, they're doing like, uh, uh, docs of like Hitler sharks and other things. And, and this, you know, I understand it, but we put a lot of that information in our, you know, in our uh, world and we miss out on all these people. And Dawn's right. I hadn't even thought about it from an Asian American and that type of thing. And of course me being an actress, I would like to see a lot of people who tell stories and who are storytellers, uh, you know, uh, be, be given some room. 
Okay, but the other part of that we need to get, are we at a point for equal justice for all? What does that mean? About it. <laughs> if you had to do that, that means no. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. Karen, we just watched that 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 policeman um, in broad daylight put his knee on that man's neck, knowing that he would not be held accountable for it. And so that means that the answer, even despite our answers, it, the truth of the matter is, if you think you can hunt down Ahmaud Aubrey and kill George Floyd or sh you know shoot Breonna Taylor and not come to justice, then there is not equal um, justice among us. And that's what people were angry about ultimately out there. But I hope that past the protest, they put into place procedure and methodology as Dawn loves to talk about the strategy of these uh, young um, freedom fighters was, was uh, very intentional. I hope they get to work. And um, I think that that's what we're doing in our way. Dawn? Um, I, I, I think that we are at one of the best moments that we have been in our history, where people are, are, a lot more people are asking the right questions. They're asking about their own part in perpetuating discriminatory systems, um, and they're asking about how to change. So, you know, what, what I see is, which I think is always a good thing, is a hunger for knowledge, um, and a willingness to have conversations, and a willingness to see things from a different perspective and to realize that your perspective is not the only one that exists. And, and I think once we do that, that's how you build empathy and understanding. And then we can really have conversations. But I think we need to do that work um, you know, in that empathy building first. We've got some others that we would like to add to the discussion right now. So let me start with uh, Hank Kilbanoff and Allison. Ben Timba. Uh, Hank is the director of Georgia Civil Rights Cold Case Project at Emory University. He's also a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and co-author of the 2006 book, The Race Beat, The Press, uh, The Civil Rights Struggle and the Awakening of a Nation. So let's give a big round of applause to Hank. He's got some great things to give us. And Allison is the campaign manager for the Truth and Transformation Project at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. Um, here in Atlanta. If you haven't been there, you need to check it out, ladies, when you come back. And an organizer of the Fulton County Remembrance Coalition, FPRC, in partnership with the Equal Justice Initiative. And I thought I saw Alexis sat on there. Alexis, do I see you on there as well? Okay, I see her picture. Yes, yes, you do. Okay, <laughs> she is there as well. So, <laughs> Alexis, another extraordinary journalist, um, first black paper here in Atlanta. That's her family. She left her job. Black at, Daily. I'm sorry? First black daily newspaper. Daily. Mm -hmm. Daily paper. I can barely hear you, Alexis. But she is here, um, uh, worked with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution for many years before going back to uh, keep that paper moving. So we thank you all for joining us. Uh, mm -hmm. Hank, talk to us. Uh, right now, glad you are here. You've reported on the civil rights movement. I love your picture. That was your screenshot just a minute ago. Uh, talk about the, the role of the newspapers in bringing attention to the movement and what was going on. How important was that at the time? Well, it, it, it was incredibly important. In the beginning, it was important because the white press didn't cover the black community. Um, it, they would run stories, you know, here and there in the paper about criminal activity and anytime they could get the word Negro and rape in the same little headline, uh, that was a, that was a good day. Um, and th thank God for the black press, uh, because they were not only telling the truth about civil rights, uh, and the dehumanization of an entire segment of, of our population and a vital segment of our population, but they were also, um, doing a lot of uplift, uh, lifting up people and remind, you know, it could have been this, a story this long about the, uh, the Negro hired by the DuPont Corporation, you know, or something, you know, Negro chemist or something like that. And um, 
you know, how do you measure the impact that that had on either end, the dehumanization or the uplift? But it was incredibly important. And of course, the race beat is just how America finally woke up to understand the problem that was right in front of them and that it could no longer deny. Of course, I think that when it did deny it, it was lying to itself. Um, so and I think that, uh, and we also trace the, the magical, you know, arc of history in, in which, you know, by the time you get to Little Rock in 57, which is still early, suddenly television is there, you know, and it's coming into the homes. Um, of course, it's in 15 minute news segments, which only changes in 63 there, you know, in Birmingham. But um, yeah, beyond incredible how important it was, or we wouldn't have done the book. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I might add that the book also saves, after 12, 16 years of work, whatever it is, I saved the entire last page of the book for John Lewis. He sort of closes out the whole story of it. But anyway, that's... I've got to read another. it. I'm embarrassed I haven't read it. Okay, I'm going to get it today. And Allison, you're going you're gonna to get me for this, but you're our youngster here. You're our babe. So tell us how young leaders like you have been influenced by the civil rights leaders of the 60s and uh, how did the documentary really influence you? What do you think it's, it's done for you? Um, yeah, so I think a lot of times there's um, a, a forced disconnect between the civil rights leaders of the 60s and my generation and the younger generations. Um, there's just a difference of opinion on how things are, are done or something like that. But especially watching this film, I realized that um, what we're doing is really just a continuation of um, the work of the congressman and his peers. And um, Don touched on this really well, that um, they were fighting to get in the door. And now we are in the door and we're not enjoying ourselves in the room that we're, we've been let into but that is our work to change that now. So that is the work we're taking on. Um, but we still can't take for granted being allowed into that door and, and take for granted the accomplishments that the Congressman um, has made um, and especially the right to vote. Um, now that we see what's happened with the elections most recently, um, our enthusiasm around voting, I guess, is probably at an all time low, um, but now that we have the right to vote and, and people died and, and went through a whole um, a whole lot to get that get us that right, it's it's our duty and um, really our our right to to maintain that and do everything we can to vote. Um, but I think in that like imagery of continuation, um, John Lewis really exemplifies going past the getting the right to vote and running for office and, and becoming somebody we can vote for because what good is the right to vote if we can only vote for people who don't agree with us or don't have our platforms um, at hand. So hopefully a lot of um, my generation will take heed and, and um, take all the stuff we learn out in the streets and, and doing our activism and take that to um, the Congress floor as well. Um, but I think one thing that really um, inspires me from John Lewis and from this film is uh, that commitment to nonviolence. I don't know if I ever really um, resonated with it until watching this film um, because it was delivered to me in that it's the opposite of violence, just kind of not being aggressive when people are trying to hurt you. But um, seeing him stay committed to nonviolence um, all the way through Congress where it's not physically violent, but there's definitely some intangible violence, I guess. Um, and, and really staying committed to that, it just reminds me how important it is for me. And that's how I stay grounded in my work is this um, kind of radical and inclusive sense of empathy for even the people that um, I don't agree with, or it's not convenient for me to uh, have empathy for, or it's um, doesn't support my message, uh, but just, I feel like that definitely helps me stay grounded and I um, learn a lot of that from John Lewis. So. Could you imagine yourself doing what he did and just being beaten, getting arrested over and over, fighting for the rights of other people, not necessarily just himself. Could you see your peers doing that? Um, I Kind of, yes. Well, I think we see it right now in the media. Um, 
my peers are out. I don't know if I can see myself doing it personally, but that's why we need people like John Lewis. Um, and I know a lot of um, my peers are out in the streets still um, down in People's Town and um, in Atlanta. Are have they been out there daily? And um, it has not been a safe experience for them. So there is a lot of similarities between then and now, but um, just keeping in mind that we, we do have our foot in the door because of uh, the people who came before us. And, and that is definitely an inspiring. Um, and seeing John Lewis um, have the career he, he has had after experiencing that violence definitely um, is inspiring to get through what we're, what we're dealing with right now. I mean, hey, talk about what you're seeing now and what you saw of the 60s. Comparisons? Um, yeah, I see, I see some real differences. I mean, I see the 60s, both the civil rights uh, that, I, that I grew up in, in, in Alabama. Uh, and that's, by the way, why my uh, invisible picture is my hero. There you the, go. Other, the, the other Hank from Alabama. Um, and, um, you know, the, there was a discipline to it that, that, that you heard Don and Erica talk about. There was a real discipline to it. There was a, a structure, there was an outline. Um, and of course, when it turned to chaos, it was always because of the police action. That was inevitably the case. Um, I felt some of that during the anti-war days because that I'm, I was of that generation of the anti-Vietnam War, though that turned out to be messier. The, the, the Black Power movement and the anti-war movement from the African-American students was itself also much more disciplined than what you got from SDS and from generally from white students. Uh, today, it doesn't quite have that discipline and maybe for better, maybe for worse. I mean, whose heart didn't break to see it turn turn violent and yet I understood why and, as, and I was not all that you know I look I stood I watched an ROTC building get burned on the night of Kent State and I said yes I, you know this is in the middle of the night no one's in there no one's going to get hurt I know but I thought now they have to listen to us and of course they they weren't going to listen then anyway and so now even now I see ah this will get people's attention and so I think in some ways the violence has helped get some attention, not always positive, but um, even if it makes some people very uncomfortable and very nervous, if they are in legislative and you know, policy making positions, I think they're gonna pay attention to this and, and worry what, you know, about what happens if they don't start paying attention. Um, so I, the discipline, the lack of discipline is one thing that's very different. I'm not sure it's all bad until people start getting killed. And that's, that's, I don't think we can. Let's see some of the pictures. I know Sheena got some pictures to show us um, have, from Good Trouble, some of what Don, Erica pulled together for this amazing documentary. If you haven't seen it, guys, please, I recommend you check it out today. Um, that is a young John Lewis, and just looking at him and looking at him face to face with troopers who called in to get them off that bridge. Um, what do you see? I, I want to ask everybody, you know, if you want to join us, but Hank, what do you see when you see these pictures and, and the one at the bridge? Let's see that one mm -hmm. again. Too. I, I, see, I see a fearlessness that speaks of moral authority. Um, he is the definition of moral authority. And when you think back who he has, I want to say defeated politically, who he has brought to their knees, he brought George Wallace to his <laughs> knees. He brought Ross Barnett to his uh -huh. knees. You know, he brings uh, Sam Bowers to his knees. These guys are little, are infinitesimal compared to, to to the towering John Lewis in the, in, in the eyes of the world. Um, and, you know, Jim Eastland, the power of the Senate Judiciary Committee who could control this country from his perch in the, in the United States Senate. No one remembers him. And everyone remembers John Lewis uh, because he stood for, for moral authority. And you know what he did? I, I think, I just my own observation from the times I've been fortunate to be with him. He really trusts people. 
-hmm. He has this innate trust. And you think, why would you trust people after what's happened? But he does trust people. I've seen him go to, when I first moved to Atlanta, he would go to parties and, and be social. And I'd never seen him accompanied by anyone. I'm sure someone drove him. Maybe they stood at the door, stood at the car. I'm talking about, you know, going back 10 years, 12 years. He just trusts people. And I've seen him trust his staff. Um, so I, I, I think that he exudes leadership uh, that, that stems from moral authority. And you see it in these pictures. Look at him. Oh, you know, wow. Just... Erica, now what is that from? Or Dawn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, um, you know, one of the things, and I'm sure Hank can speak to this, is when you've lived your life for six decades in public service, he tends to be asked the same questions and to tell the, the you know, similar stories. So, um, one of the things we wanted to do was to see if we could, you know, get some more details from some of these iconic moments. So we, we rented a stage in Washington, D.C. This is the arena stage. Uh, we constructed three large screens and then we made him these uh, archival, you know, short films that show so many of the things that he did. And then I, you know, put him there and he would watch. And then I would say, you know, tell me the story of that day. And that's how we did his master interview. You know, in the middle of that uh, taping, he said, you know, we included in the, in the film, I'm seeing things I've never seen before. And, and I think he's, he's definitely talking about some footage and some bits of archive, but I think he's also talking about all of it because laying out those moments, I think, you know, you'll see also in the film how the public is just, you know, so many people are overcome when they meet him and they want to go up and talk to him and say hello. And, you know, as Hank says, he's, he, he really likes people. He really is very trusting. He doesn't have like a, you know, entourage security guard or anything. Um, but I think in this moment, I like to think that he saw what we see, you know, he's understood how just overwhelming it is to understand. If you go back to the picture on the bridge, um, if you can get back to that photo, if you see the man to his right, that's um, Hosea, and he's holding his nose because he knows they're about to be gassed. And, you know, when he explained that detail, um, it, it just kind of rocks your, you know, countenance when you think that these people, you know, confronted, they, they don't have weapons. They are confronting an armed militia that is the state that is working against its own people. So, um, you know, the moral authority is, is exactly right. But it is also, you know, and I come from a journalism background, the images portraying that authority, that is what has moved America. And, and that is something that we are seeing again, you know, the images that are outrage our shared sense of, of morality. So, you know, that, that harkens back to these times. I love if that. I might That's add just one other thing. Yeah, if, can I just add one other thing yeah. that when I, when, I, when I was speaking of John Lewis that I have learned through the Civil Rights Cold Cases Project at Emory and through the Barry Truce, the podcast that I do, and I get to meet people who, who are the survivors of people who were killed. Isaiah Nixon, because he voted in 1948, you know, in A.C. Hall, simply because he was out walking one night and was mistaken for someone else and was shot in the back by police. And it goes on and on and on. James Brazier killed in 1958 because he was driving a 1958 Chevrolet Impala. And you meet their families and you know who they are very much like? They're like John Lewis. Their faith is as strong and inspiring as any I've ever seen. And so he is at the top, he's at the mountaintop of people who are like that, but he's not the only person. Uh, he's probably the only person in Congress <laughs> <laughs> who's like that, you know, or maybe in all of Washington. But I meet people who, you know, who, you know, the family of a man who voted in 1948 for the first time, and his family will never miss an election. They will vote. They will never miss church. And everyone's going to get every day of education they possibly can. Those are the three things. And, you know, in the second season of the podcast, we, we go back to the, with the 
children of Dover Carter, NAACP field secretary in a small county, chairman of a small county, who, who got beat up badly for voting. And we go by his gravesite, and he's, he's side by side with his wife. And as I'm looking at her gravesite, I realize that she lived long enough to, to vote for Barack Obama for president. She lived to like 99 years old. And she lived long enough to serve to she he she died five days after Obama was inaugurated, you know, and this means everything to them. That was a payoff to them finally. And so there, I guess my point is that there are masses of people out there who have that kind of steadfast faith and trust that John Lewis embodies. I have a question for um, Alexis. You know, we've talked about this. I grew up in Chicago, so the Defender was was our paper. Um, but people are asking about the new black press, uh, the Tribe, Zora, um, the Root, the Grio. What are your thoughts on these new medium? And Hank, you as well. Anyone who wants to answer, but uh, we want to start with Alexis Alexa. is the expert. Alexa, you are Alexa. You're uh, Alexa. You're mute. All right. Hey, I'm here. There you go. All right, great. I am not the expert on the new black press, but I will say that it has evolved as well as the movement has evolved. And one I want to make one comment about the evolution of the movement is that before it was very well organized and planned. And even the white folk knew what the black folk were going to do before they did it. And then they would work out how they were going to solve it or resolve it after some bad happened or violence. But the other thing with the young folk, particularly beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement, they didn't have that background that organized with coordination with the white folk or the authority, whoever they were. And that made a big difference because nobody knew what was going to happen. Everybody was afraid. Everybody was scared. And they just want, it just appeared that they just wanted to disrupt stuff as opposed to solve something. But I think it has evolved from there now. And they are beginning to get more organized and sophisticated about how they approach what they're going to do, which is a good thing, I think. And the other thing that I want to say is that in this pandemic era with the virus, the pandemic of racism is being exposed more in the, the way that the uh, reporting on people who are getting sick and dying is disproportionate, people of color, particularly black people, and that people are out of 40 million people out of work and they're paying attention to the TV and news and they're seeing this and it's affecting them and they can see how easily they can be impacted by whatever bad, can, bad thing can happen to black folk, it happen to them too. So I think that that is giving some making a, a bit of a difference in what might could happen. I'm not sure, I don't have a whole lot of hope about what good possibly could have come from this, but I think there is an opportunity that maybe something good can happen, but it's gotta be across the board. It's just not about police brutality. It's about racism in every aspect of American life. Six minutes left and we are running out of time. Man, I can sit here with you guys all day long. Uh, can I get everybody to talk to me about is the US more polarized now than it was in 68? This is a question from the audience uh, for Dawn and Hank, actually, at the top. I don't know, Hank, what do you, what do you think? I do have I some... think it is. I think it is. I, I, I think it is. You don't have as many shades of gray as you did back then. The, you know, politics was a Venn diagram, and there was sort of a lot of people, you know, left of center, right of center, but not extreme and and now no one people just aren't open-minded and paying as much attention to what they're hearing from others you know still a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest to steal the line from simon and garfunkel mm. i i would agree with that um i do want to uh get in though that um allison of all the interviews that i've done i've done a lot um i am singularly thrilled to hear your commentary um, because we are looking to you and you do stand on strong shoulders. Um, I can tell you from conversations with a congressman, he is thrilled to see people like you because he doesn't believe there's one way to march towards justice. He believes that we need to include 
you know, um, multiple voices. So there was a question about how would the civil rights movement be different? I, I think it's back to what Hank said about that moral authority. And John Lewis never would let people forget that they needed to behave in a moral fashion and they needed to exemplify the life that they were trying to create. So, um, you know, when I, when I see the work that the young people are doing and how they're doing it, um, you know, what I want to say to you is the most important thing I learned from making this film was the planning and strategy uh, and execution um, that the young people like had. And, and that that's, you know, I'm just really excited to see what you do. <laughs> I'm gonna try and round table, round rob, and get these all these in. Interesting one, funding. What challenges and blessings did you encounter paying for this film? Uh, we were uh, mostly blessed. Um, there, you know, it's not a hard sell to say John Lewis. So CNN came with the idea. We have an international distributor. Uh, we have a theatrical distributor, Magnolia Pictures. Uh, participant films, and then we had one uh, large private donor, Katie Barksdale. Um, so, but it took all of those folks. That the big expense, two big expenses on any film are the people, because it takes a lot of people, and the archive. The archive here, a lot of, of what you will see is is Congressman with, with Martin Luther King. It's some of the most expensive archive there is, so. And somebody said, uh, as a constituent of DeKalb County, Georgia, what would they learn from this film that they don't already know? They can dance. He <laughs> a lot. I, I he, likes dance. Dance. He, can't, he, he likes to dance. I don't know if he can dance. Yeah. <laughs> he can dance. <laughs> Let us happy. We tell on you. We don't tell on you. <laughs> you are recorded. <laughs> so, I, real quick, I want to Josh. say something real quick um, I, before we get out of here because you talked about news. And, um, you know, and Allison, this may suit some of uh, the young people that are coming up, but there really is a problem inside of local and rural news and the things that we have. It's not just fake news, it's no news. It's no real local news. So Color Farm has partnered with Google to, they're actually doing a training eight week boot camp that's fully remote and um, for entrepreneurs who want to start local new businesses. So they should go to colorfarmmedia.com, colorfarmmedia.com and take advantage of this type of training and, and push to get more news and local news and people of color in, in the news game. Um, and it's very hard to succeed and so many media businesses shutting down. I think this is good training and that's what will change things on the ground is information. Um, if I could just pop in one real quick, um, just to defend my generation a little bit. Um, I think there is a lot, uh, a lot more um, planning going on behind the scenes, but we are saturated with, like you said, there is not, there is no news. So like um, people have been consistently out in the streets and, and maintaining a presence out there for the last month or so um, and, and doing that very strategically. Um, but we only get the press when somebody does shoot a gun or does do something that is um and and everybody can take on these names now with social media so you don't necessarily know if it's black lives matter or just somebody that says black lives matter um but i i think that is important especially because we were all raised with this color blindness generation and everything is all good because of the civil rights movement so us kind of um having to pivot real quick um and deal with that is yeah. is a different experience I would just say to you, just don't be disheartened by that. We know you're there because there's no way that, that all of these things keep happening. They're not spontaneously growing out of the street. So I think people with a microphone have to do better at looking for those stories and pushing those stories too. And that does lead back to the question about the black press. Um, you know, I do see people asking those questions um, but but I, I take your point, and it, it's uh, a really strong and important one. And, and I personally will pledge, you know, in the rooms that I'm in, to say, you know, I'd like to see, I'd like to see what we didn't see with John Lewis. We didn't see the portrayal of their organizing. We saw them getting beat up. 
So this is a long, you know, held problem, but it's not one that we have to repeat. Mm -hmm. Right. I agree. It is 3.01, guys. How fabulous. Did it go fast or what? Or was it just me? Yeah, that was fast. It went so fast. It's going faster. Because we could have done so much more. So that means, uh-oh, did I lose you? That means we've got to do another one sometime soon. So the press club is on here. Guys, we got to set them up for another one once everybody's seen the documentary and then they can give us more questions. But Allison, love you. I know I'll see so much more from you. Hank, going to get the book today. Thank you. Dawn, mm -hmm. so proud of you, what you're accomplishing. I, I, I see you want to say something. Go, Erica. I, I was saying I'm getting his book too. I actually was looking it up on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to be listening to your podcast, and Allison, I'll be following you. And uh, Miss Alexis, thank you so much, and, um, um, uh, and for all the work that you've done in the Atlanta Press Club. Aaron, of course, Dawn, I love. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, guys. We appreciate it. And the bosses are there. So are we clear to say goodbye to everyone? Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you, Karen, for, for leading the discussion. And boy, it was a wonderful one. And if, if the audience who's watching right now hasn't seen the film, uh, please do that. It's on many platforms right now. Um, definitely see that. And as a journalist who's interviewed John Lewis four times, you know, our hearts go out to him. And we're just so grateful for his, you know, service to our country uh, through the Congress and just as an activist and everything he's done. Um, but thank you all again, Karen, Don, Erica, Hank, Allison, and Alexis for joining us today. Wonderful discussion. Thank you so much. If you want to know more about what we do at the Atlanta Press Club, visit our website at atlantapressclub.org. We have lots of events coming up. You can join as a member, make a donation. Uh, but thank you again for everybody for joining us. Great discussion today. Take Thanks care. So Bye. Bye, guys. Thanks, and I'll see you guys in another Zoom in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everybody. Bye.